You're listening to the Carleton Political Science Podcast, brought to you by the Department of Political Science at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I'm also me, one of the PhD students with the program. Okay, so this week I thought since we just had an election here in Canada, it'd be a good idea to talk about members of parliament because that's kind of an important thing. It's central to democracy and central to parliamentary democracy. And so we have one of the PhD students from the department here, Louise Cockrum, who specializes in MPs, particularly new MPs and the processes that they go through when they become an MP. Hi, Louise. Oh, hi, Azif. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. So yeah, we just had an election of which there there were, I'm assuming, many new MPs who came into office. What's the sort of process they go through once they're voted in? So a lot of MPs that I've spoken to for my dissertation project um, kind of describe that process of transitioning from being an electoral candidate to being an elected member as a trial by fire in the sense that nothing really can prepare you to do the job of an MP. So um, the day after you're elected as an, as an MP in Canada, you get uh, a phone call from the House of Commons basically telling you sort of when to arrive for orientation. Um, if you're kind of a member of a party, your party, somebody from your party will kind of tell you when the first kind of party caucus meeting is in, in Ottawa. And of course, at that time, as soon as you're elected, uh, you basically have a, a barrage of uh, constituents uh, kind of wanting to kind of contact you um, kind of basically about their issues because I mean constituents um, you know they'll start contacting MPs right away because they don't have you know because their problems important to them they don't have any kind of sense of um, MPs are very overwhelmed at this point and of course at this point in time the MP doesn't have any kind of staff or any um, kind of office infrastructure set up. They haven't been allocated an office yet. So it's it's quite an overwhelming time for members. Of course, the House of Commons does try and kind of ease that process by allocating each new member of parliament um, a buddy who's a, a member of House of Commons staff that's kind of seconded to help MPs sort of navigate the orientation process, help them navigate the process of kind of fi finding some temporary accommodation in Ottawa. Because, of course, if you're an MP from, you know, northern BC, you can't you can't commute very easily. So you actually have to get like a hotel or an apartment in, in Ottawa. Your, bu your buddy kind of helps you with that. It's a very kind of overwhelming experience uh, for MPs when they're first elected. Were there a lot of new MPs voted in in the recent federal election? Uh, there were. Uh, there were about, I think it's 98 MPs who were elected in the last federal election. And so that means that basically 27% of, uh, of the House of Commons currently is comprised of rookie MPs with no federal experience. Um, and I mean, that's a, a bit less of a, a percentage than uh, in 2015, when I think it was like 59% of the House was uh, was completely uh, comprised of new, new MPs. So I think the House administration and the parties, which are basically the two main main sort of sources of orientation that MPs kind of have when they when they entered. There was less of a kind of a logistical problem in kind of helping new MPs this term because there was this for the 2019 election than there was for the 2015 election, simply because there were fewer MPs, uh, new MPs elected. So, so the orientation... Nah. So the orientation system that we have right now, has, is this kind of how it's always been done? Is it a long-standing system or is it something fairly recent? Um, so that's a really interesting question. Um, so from my understanding, uh, the orientation in Canada has been in place since about the late 70s, early 80s. I think it's like since 1979, there has been an orientation process whereby the House of Commons provides at least one session on house procedure, administrative kind of aspects of being an MP. So for example, how to claim expenses, the types of 
staff you might want to hire but the orientation has been much more professionalized since 79 I think they're kind of improving every year and that kind of goes along with the trend of uh, the professionalization of parliament right and the professionalization of the job of an MP because um, if you think about like MPs uh, kind of you know when when Canada was kind of founded as a, as a government uh, they were basically it was basically a part-time job right like and it was a part-time job of a very elite class of kind of white men in society whereas now the the job of an MP is much more it's much more of a job much more of a profession so I think that the professionalization of orientation so kind of providing a lot more information to MPs in terms of what they should be doing almost like an onboarding process uh, for kind of almost like a corporate job or at least they're trying to now uh, that kind of it, it's a contrast to what they're providing in like 1979 uh, uh, kind of through the through the 80s and early 90s which is a lot more kind of laissez-faire hands-off and that's not to say that the orientation process now that the has provides us is absolutely perfect um, a lot of the orientation now kind of compared to 1979 includes um, a lot more information and a lot of MPs because the orientation happens in a, in kind of basically like a two-day period so they have it's basically um, almost like a lecture style format where they have the clerk the speaker um, also kind of former MPs speaking to them um, over the course of two days it's a lot of MPs say it's very overwhelming just because they're getting like a fire hose of information um, at a time when they're very overwhelmed with the you know the process of getting their constituency office set up they're still waiting to be allocated an office uh, in parliament uh, for their whip they're 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 receiving bags of you know, physical communication, thousands of emails, lots of calls um, from constituents and, and other people. So, yeah, um, the, pr the orientation has kind of evolved over the years, um, but like it, it's still not, not, the, not perfect. And for orientations, you mentioned the stuff that parliamentary offices set up. Are there also like do the parties do any sort of orientations as well? Is there also private programs, anything beyond just what Parliament does? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so it, through my research, I've actually found that the party has a much kind of greater impact in the orientation of MPs than the House does. Um, and so that, I mean, parties do put on kind of ad hoc orientation sessions so for example back in 2015 the conservative party did uh, a couple of like mock question periods with their new MPs so sort of like a, a model UN but with uh, MPs in, in question period and that was basically just to familiarize uh, the new MPs within the conservative caucus on how to basically carry themselves in question period how to uh, ask questions that, you know with effective intonation effective language things like that so the parties do provide orientation but this orientation from the parties it, it's not only for kind of formal sessions it's sometimes you know MPs sometimes learn through their caucus sort of informally either by asking questions of um, kind of senior MPs within their caucus and this is usually done sort of on a regional basis so um, I know in 2015 a lot of the Liberal MPs in Atlantic Canada um, who were new because obviously in 2015 uh, the Liberals uh, uh, basically swept Atlantic Canada um, a lot of the senior MPs within that kind of region of the country reached out to um, kind of the the junior MPs who were elected at that time and kind of took them under their wing and it was sort of an ad hoc informal mentorship situation. The other way that MPs kind of informally learn through their party is for kind of asking questions of um, the house leaders, their party house leaders office and the whips office. Um, so if a, an MP has a question about procedure, because the, the House of Commons procedure and practices is quite difficult for lay people, so people who have not 
being in, you know, who've not sat in parliament, it's very difficult for them to kind of understand procedure because it's a quite an archaic system. You know, you can't refer to people by name. You have to refer to them as their constituency or like the right honourable member for wherever. Um, and so basically MPs will kind of naturally gravitate towards like the whip's office to ask questions because they're unfamiliar with procedures. So yeah, that's how basically how parties are involved in orientation. There's another group uh, outside of parliament or the parties involved in orientation. And that's the Initiative for Parliamentary and Diplomatic Engagement here at Carlton, which is quite um, an interesting program. It usually happens uh, several months after an election. It's, it's organized by a lady named Maureen Boyd, who's quite well connected uh, in Ottawa. Um, and she basically, she organizes this orientation and she invites people like um, professors from Carleton. She invites sort of former MPs. And basically that orientation more so looks at the types of policy issues that new MPs might be kind of dealing with over the course of, of the parliament they've been elected into. So for example, um, you know, in 2015, that might have been issues dealing with sort of um, electoral reform, um, which the government did did promise uh, last election, um, as well as kind of other, other kind of issues that w were likely to come up over the course of the, the four year for your kind of session of, of parliament. And MPs really enjoy that session. Um, MPs seem to kind of <laughs> resonate with that session a lot more than they do the, the official House of Commons orientation. Also because uh, the, the session that Maureen Boyd puts on at, at Carlton actually, they do sort of almost like field trips to like the Supreme Court and kind of important sites <laughs> in um, in like Ottawa so that uh, the, uh, the new MPs kind of get a sense of of uh, kind of the, the the larger context of government, uh, like beyond uh, where they sit in the House of Commons. So. so much has been written in Canadianist literature about the divide between the provinces and the federal government, the federalist divide. When it comes to orientations for members of parliament versus members of provincial parliament, is there a difference? Are they similar? So the only uh, kind of example I can really speak to is uh, Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. So from my understanding, uh, it's pretty similar in uh, in Nova Scotia with respect to MPs, f uh, sorry, uh, members of the Nova Scotia Legislative Assembly find it very overwhelming uh, when they first kind of are elected because they have again, they have constituents calling them the day after the election. They they don't have an office set up yet. They, they don't have the infrastructure that they need to actually start doing with constituents requests, start, you know, having an effect on legislation or doing any of the things that we expect our representatives to do. So I think it's it's largely similar at the kind of the provincial level. I've not really heard of any kind of unique cases uh, anywhere with regards to kind of provincial orientation, although I think it would be kind of a really interesting future project to research because I do think it is an important consideration, like especially since a lot, well not a lot, but like a, a fairly large minority of uh, MPs did serve provincially prior to um, kind of entering uh, the House of Commons in, in Ottawa. So it'd be really interesting to see kind of how that experience serving provincially helps uh, in Ottawa. So. And you've done a lot of work in the UK, and I'm a parliamentary system. Um, how does the orientation process compare in the UK versus Canada? It's it's a, a fairly similar um, system. I guess the only difference is, um, so in addition to the formal induction sessions, which MPs get in Canada and the UK, in Canada, um, MPs receive sort of office visits from the various service centres within the house. So that means, you know, offices like IT, legal services, um, accounting, all the things the MP needs really to kind of learn 
the administration of their jobs. And in, in the Canadian case, the offices come to them. Whereas because um, there's almost, I think, a, a tw a twice as many MPs in the UK than Canada, in addition to kind of the formal induction kind of lecture style session in the UK, um, there's like a new members reception area in the in for MPs in the UK that's basically like almost like, um, you know, when you first get to university and there's like it's almost like a job fair or like a, a like a, a society's fair whereby like you have for example like IT IPS the independent parliamentary standards authority which of course was created in uh, 2009 after the expenses scandal in the UK so essentially um, it seems a bit more like in the UK MPs have to kind of use their own initiative to get uh, information that um, is kind of, I don't want to say spoon fed to MPs in Canada, but it seems as though if you're an MP in, in the UK, you have to kind of seek out this information a bit more. The other kind of difference with the UK orientation is that um, the orientation in the UK is very poorly attended by MPs, um, and this has been the case uh, for, for a while now. Um, and you can kind of theorize why. My, my kind of personal theory, um, and this has kind of been confirmed a little bit from my interviews, is that uh, MPs, like I mentioned, are extremely busy. Once they get elected, they're bombarded by constituents. They have, um, you know, they have kind of issues of getting their office set up, things like that. Um, but they also have their, their their parties kind of tugging them towards uh, their their agenda, and and they're more likely to kind of go to their party for advice. So yeah, that that's basically the picture in the UK. Okay, and one last question. What have you been up to lately? You recently did some field work, which took you to the UK. How did that go? That went really well, actually. So my project is a, is a comparison between uh, the UK and Canada in terms of how MPs make that transition from being an electoral candidate to an elected uh, member of parliament. And so I, I had already kind of done my interviews here in Canada and I'd, uh, I'd found out uh, kind of a lot of uh, um, interesting information here, particularly that, you know, it's, it's kind of informal socialization for the party rather than um, the sort of orientation organized by the House of Commons that that is uh, kind of has more of an effect on, on MPs. But there, there were things in the UK that that weren't present in my interviews in Canada. So for instance, um, as you'll know as a, a fan of Oasis, um, class, class is um, an issue in the UK. And uh, a lot of the uh, kind of people I interviewed there um, said that uh, if you are, said that the UK House of Commons, because it's uh, it's very boisterous, it's very kind of, reminiscent of an old boys club or a public school particularly when you kind of look at the the current front front bench of the government with Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg and, and people like that um, it, it's very alienating for people for new MPs who are from a working class background who don't necessarily know how to kind of tap into those social networks that are invisible um, until you kind of get to parliament because parliament because the UK has a commons it's a uh, it's very, like it's steeped in history. There's almost sort of like a, a, as one of my interviewees said, there's almost kind of like a museum-like quality to the place. Like there's a lot of reverence to its history when its history is quite exclusionary. Uh, like women didn't get the right to vote until, you know, 1928. Like it's quite alienating for people who are not from like a, a kind of a, a public school Oxbridge background um, because there are skills that you have to learn, kind of social skills, political skills to kind of fit in with the boys club like culture there. And I don't necessarily mean that like in a gendered way. I mean that more in a sort of a uh, kind of a class way in the sense that uh, there's there's kind of networks that are, are difficult to join if you are f not from that background. The, the kind of final thing that I do want to mention is that um, 
a lot of the MPs I've spoken to in both Canada uh, and the and the UK uh, have mentioned that uh, one of the things that they didn't really expect or know what it'd be like until they until they kind of entered office is um, the difficulties in work life and work family balance because as I mentioned kind of at the outset MPs from the get go um, are you know, they're contacted by constituents. It's a very overwhelming job, particularly in Canada where, um, you know, you have great distances to travel. You know, kind of being with your family every weekend might not be, you know, something that's possible. And so that, and I mean, that's particularly a problem for women, um, but it's also a problem for men too with young families. And it's a challenge that um, it's kind of a theme that's come through in my research that I think is something that I need to kind of dig a bit deeper into. And I, but, and I think it's also an important consideration for like the UK and Canadian House of Commons to kind of think about how they can accommodate young families and how they can uh, how they can kind of ensure that people do have the opportunity to kind of see their families a bit more while also kind of, you know, doing their job well as a member of parliament. So, yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks so much and thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having really me. Really fascinating stuff and look forward to having you back on again soon. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Anyways, everyone, thank you for listening. You can follow us on SoundCloud in the coming weeks, also on Spotify and iTunes. Till next time, take care. <laughs>